sure. It's just another vlog. About just another book. By just another girl. Living in a post-colonial world. But we try not to die trying. Have some coffee. Take a seat. And let's read. But alas, the heart forgets. The heart is distracted and May time passes. Summer ends, the storms break over the rot ripe orchards and the heart grows old. Well, the hours, the days, the months, and the years pile up and pile up. Till the mind becomes too crowded and too confused. Hi everyone and welcome back to Mina Wonders. So today I'm going to be doing a video that I feel like I've been working on for a really really long time and this is going to be a video talking about the life and work of Nick Joaquin. So Nick Joaquin is one of my favorite Filipino writers and as far as the Philippine literary canon goes I feel like he's kind of my literary bias and so I'm hoping that this video will kind of do that justice and that you guys will um, sort of come away from this video more interested in exploring his body of work. So the way that I'm going to be structuring this video is dividing it into three main chapters. I will chapter this video so that you guys can skip ahead or move forward as you'd like. And um, first I'm going to be talking about who Nick Joaquin is what he lived through and his unique position in Philippine history. And next, I'm going to be talking about what I think makes his work great, uh, what his specific techniques were that he used, and why his work is so important to Philippine letters. And lastly, we will go through some book recommendations for those of you who would either like to start uh, reading Nick Joaquin or those of you guys who are just looking to deepen your understanding of his body of work. Nick Joaquin was born Nicomedes Joaquin on May 4, 1917. He was a novelist, poet, playwright, essayist, historian, and biographer whose main preoccupation was the complex heritage of the Filipino people. His father fought as a colonel in the Filipino-Spanish slash American wars under Emilio Aguinaldo, and Nick Joaquin lived through World War II and the Japanese occupation, as well as the Marcos dictatorship and martial law. And he wrote through all of these events and more via both his fiction and very creative nonfiction. One of the things that makes Nick Joaquin very unique is that he was able to sort of write about all of these historical events while neither aggrandizing or kind of trivializing the idea of Filipino consciousness and the Filipino identity. However, he was also able to write these like tales and essays that tell the story of discovery, loss, longing, desire, and basically being haunted by a very persistent kind of hopefulness. Like most Filipino writers, he also had his share of international experience and exposure. He traveled to Spain, Mexico, the US, and uh, to Taiwan, Cuba, and China. He was actually supposed to become a priest. Um, he got a scholarship to the Dominican monastery, I think, in Hong Kong. And to this day, I can't sort of stop thinking about how I'm so happy that he didn't end up becoming a priest because I really think that his contribution to Philippine letters is invaluable. And I mean that because I think that Nick Joaquin is someone that really used his literary prowess to write toward the Filipino experience and to kind of be very conscious of the things that are happening around him. And if you guys sort of peek a little bit more into Philippine letters, you will find that that is not always the case. In Gina Apostol's introduction to Nick Joaquin's um, anthology, which I will show you guys later during the recommendations part of this, she actually talks about how when Ferdinand Marcos, uh, the dictator, offered him the national artist, like award or honor, he actually almost said no. And he only ended up saying yes because he kind of ended up using 
that invitation to him as leverage to be able to free the political prisoner and poet Jose F. Lacaba. And so Nick Joaquin sort of told Marcos that he would accept if Jose Lacaba was allowed to go home, which he was. And I think it's that kind of um, smartness, but also that kind of being able to see how everything is interconnected that really kind of puts Nick Joaquin at the top of my list. He also wrote in English and I feel like his attitude about writing in English is something that I really like. He calls it writing in English with a Filipino accent and I think that that's very very apt and I feel like I agree with his description of writing in English as also making language our own and mastering the language, which still has merit even if its origins were in colonial education. When it comes to what makes Nick Joaquin special or what about his writing is so evocative and memorable, I really think that it's a combination of two things. The first thing being mastery of language and technique. I feel like Nick Joaquin is someone who is able to approach certain storylines and certain themes in a way that is very nuanced and which doesn't cut corners, doesn't walk on eggshells, but also um, knows where to draw the line, if that makes sense. So a good example of that would be his short story called Three Generations, where he basically talks about <laughs> abusive patriarchy and how um, fathers and sons have a very complicated relationship because even if one son tries not to be like his father, he will sort of find himself also falling into those traps if he isn't mindful. And the way that that story was written and executed, I think, is just excellent. Another more popular example, I think, of the way that Nick Joaquin executes his stories flawlessly is in his most popular story, The Summer Solstice. So The Summer Solstice basically follows this very affluent couple. They are Adon and Donya in a province here in the Philippines. And we follow them on the day of the summer solstice, so the longest day in the entire year, basically. And that day is also the day on which two coinciding festivals are happening. The first one is a Catholic festival. It's the festival of St. John the Baptist. And basically, it takes place during the day. And the tradition is that men run around naked, splashing each other with water. And then at night, there's another festival that happens, which is a pagan festival, and it's called the Taddarin. So Taddarin is primarily run by women or wild women. And because of that, a lot of people in the story kind of look down on uh, the Taddarin custom. It's seen as uncouth, it's seen as unfettered. This story opens with our couple getting ready for the day, and uh, Doña Lupeng kind of sees her housekeeper in this weird kind of frenzied state, and basically, she kind of looks down on her and thinks that she's irresponsible and is very preoccupied with kind of her disdain for her housekeeper for going to the the Tarin festival. But then throughout the entire day, we sort of see Doña Lupeng's life and how everything that she does is kind of subject to her husband's approval. And as the day progresses, you see that her disdain for what her housekeeper did is really a kind of envy and a kind of fascination. And so that night, she convinces um, Don Paeng to bring her to the Tadarin festival where she experiences that wildness and that wakefulness firsthand. And really, the story is about power play between them. And the writing in it is so freaking beautiful. And one good example of how Nick Joaquin executes this is that he uses certain phrases which he repeats throughout the entire sequence. So for example, there's a line, it was burning with the intense immense fever of noon. And at the start of the story, that means one thing, uh, especially because it's being used in this very um, like hot, dry, arid, like masculine sense. And then later on, it's used to describe the power that Doña Lupeng comes into. 
So yeah, it's just, oh, it's so freaking good. And I think that leads me to my second point about what makes Nick Joaquin's work so great. And that is that he is not afraid of difficult and uncomfortable conversations. And I think maybe he's also able to kind of create space for those conversations within his work because he is so skilled. So for example, with Summer Solstice, it would be so easy in the hands of a more irresponsible or less skilled writer for this to just be like a simplistic didactic tale about like, hey, treat women better. But because it's so nuanced and so haunting, he's able to put a number of layers on it. And there's been a lot of debate actually about Summer Solstice and whether or not it is a feminist text. Some people would argue that since Danya Lupeng does come into her own, sort of, you guys will know what I mean if, if you read it, and I hope you do. And uh, yeah, and so those people um, usually say that like, yeah, this is a feminist text. Um, he was saying that, of course, like men and women are equal or are supposed to be treated the same. But then there are also people who kind of talk about how the imagery at the end still portrays the moon or like the feminine energy as having to live up to the male or the sun energy because the light from the full moon is just a reflection of the sun and so um, there cannot be or it's very rare for that moon energy to actually shine and it's impossible to do it without the sun. And my opinion on this is that I don't think it's a fully feminist text. I do feel like Nick Joaquin, for all of his writing talent and like big brainness, was also still a product of his time. So I wouldn't put it past him actually if what he was thinking of was that women should be empowered but like they are still living in a patriarchal or a male society, male driven society. But I think the important thing is he was kind of able to open up that door to have that conversation. And I think it was Gina Postol again who said in her introduction to his work that it was a kind of proto-feminism. It wasn't exactly like feminism as we would know it now and maybe he didn't necessarily subscribe to um, the wave of feminism that was happening during his time. But it was definitely an exploration of that and it was definitely like planting the seeds to have this bigger conversation. So now let's move on to our recommendations. First, I will begin with kind of a show and tell of two books of his that um, I have but I wouldn't necessarily recommend as the best place to start. And then I'll move on to my two main recommendations for those who are starting out reading Nick Joaquin. This is the oldest in my Nick Joaquin collection and this is just uh, prose and poems by Nick Joaquin. I got this back in college. You know, it's strange, like I can't remember actually where I bought this, but it says National Bookstore for 160 pesos. And the thing about these editions is that they're usually super cheap, so I think they're worth it. They're usually super complete, but just the way, like the production on them isn't very good. The pages are super thin, so you just have to be very, very careful. I think the thing that's keeping me from uh, kind of recommending this is that this, yes, it does have some of his plays and some of his really good um, short stories, including Summer Solstice and May Day Eve, but I feel like it's just kind of all over the place and they're like, poems, you know, and I'm just, I'm not such a big fan of his poems. Although, like, they're not bad, but I don't think they are his best work. And next is one that I haven't read yet, actually. This is Tropical Baroque and Four Manileño uh, Theatricals. These are some plays. And I think the most famous one here is A Portrait of the Artist as Filipino. And I have a feeling that will be, like, a super funny read. But something that's also really exciting about this is that there is one called Tatarin. So this one is kind of a spin-off of uh, Doña Lupeng's um, experience <laughs> from Summer Solstice. So yeah, I'm looking forward to reading this. And now for the actual recommendations. 
First, I would recommend this. Oh my god, I'm so happy that this happened. This is the Penguin Classics edition of Nick Joaquin's work, The Woman Who Had Two Navels and Tales of the Tropical Gothic. And it's just so good. <laughs> it's so good. Like the stories that they curated are just beautiful they're perfect and honestly like the title story of this is one of the most haunting ones that I have read possibly ever I feel like Nick Joaquin sometimes writes the way that Wong Kar Wai films movies if that makes sense like there's just something super haunting and super atmospheric and moody about it uh, it's just so delicious and it's partly set in Hong Kong and in that space, it kind of discusses like this longing for home that a lot of displaced Filipinos have and how they pass it on to their children and how there's sort of a fracturedness in the nature of that dream. Oh, it's just so good. Although there are some trigger warnings like for sexual violence and violence and rape in these, um, they are discussed very well though, I think. Um, for example, the violence is seen as violent, if that makes sense. Like, it's not permissive. And for that, I feel like it it just is a really good social commentary on those things. So yeah, would definitely recommend. And also, the preface and the foreword are by Gina Apostol and Vicente Rafael. And I was like super duper starstruck because Gina Apostol is someone that I read from last month and whose books I think are just ingenious, like the way that she's able to write about Filipino history. <sighs> Shocked. And Vicente Rafael is a historian and critic who I was reading for my thesis. So just, wow, like having him talk about Nick Joaquin was pretty freaking amazing. And I feel like their commentary also properly frames um, this anthology. Yeah, <laughs> read it. And if you guys aren't from the Philippines, you can definitely still get this. Um, it is an international edition, so please try and get your hands in it. I promise you will not regret it. And last but not the least, I want to recommend um, this nonfiction book. This is Culture and History, of course, again by Nick Joaquin. And recently, I've been trying to rack my brains for the word for something that is like a novel, but it's nonfiction, but it's not memoir. If you guys know what the word for that is, let me know. This is that, basically. Um, there are a number of um, sort of chapters that kind of build into this one very long essay about Filipino culture, history, and our notions and identity as Filipinos. And something that I really enjoy in this book is just how thorough Nick Joaquin's exploration is of the different tools that we used and the different sort of ages that there were in the Spanish colonization. And I just, I find it so interesting because when we think of the Spanish colonization, we always tend to think of the war, we tend to think of the coming of America and then the coming of the Japanese and then just all of this fighting and of course that was part of it but he also looks at the different nuances of culture that we got from them, the way that uh, food was sort of introduced into like the Filipino culture and I think it's also interesting that he kind of champions this idea of existential cultural identity and existential national identity where it isn't that there is like just one capital T true essence of what a Filipino is. The thing about identity and existence as he argues in this book is that it is existentialist. So the existence precedes the essence. Things happen to us and then we process it and then it becomes part of who we are and then we can sort of process it as part of who we are if that makes sense. And I just, chef's kiss. Like I really, really enjoyed this. And I'm going to be looking forward to picking up more books from Paring Nick Joaquin. And I think the next one I want to read is another like book of this sort, which is A Question of Heroes. And that delves more into like Rizal, Andres Bonifacio, and uh, the social politics of choosing our national heroes. 
right? Okay, so thank you guys so much for joining me for this video. That is it for today. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know if you like this editing style, if you like this film style. Let me know what your favorite Nick Joaquin work is. Have you read any of these books or stories and what did you think of them? Don't forget also to please like this video if you liked it and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you guys next time.